Hi viewers, welcome to our channel, the section of human body. In this video, we are going to discuss about the external features of the heart. I want you to orient yourself to the cadaver first. And what you see here is the mediastinum. And the two lungs have been removed. As you know, the mediastinum is a thick movable septum found between the two lungs or between the pleural cavities. The mediastinum is divided into superior mediastinum above the level of the sternal angle and inferior mediastinum below the level of the sternal angle. The inferior mediastinum is further divided into three parts, three subdivisions, namely anterior mediastinum which is between the sternum and costal cartilages and pericardium and it is a pericardium which divides the inferior mediastinum into three parts. The anterior mediastinum is in front of the pericardium and the posterior mediastinum is behind the pericardium. This is the right mediastinal pleura, this is the left mediastinal pleura. Of course, this is a costal pleura, this is the line of pleural reflection. The costal pleura is getting reflected onto the mediastinum as the mediastinal pleura. We are going to strip off the mediastinal pleura. Between the mediastinal pleura and pericardium, you can see the phrenic nerve. Can you see the phrenic nerve in front of the root of the lung? And it is found running between the mediastinal pleura and pericardium. Similarly, on the other side, I am just And this is the pericardium, the fibrous pericardium. What I am holding on my left hand is the mediastinal pleura. Yes. Now, you can see here, can you see a nerve here? This nerve is the left phrenic nerve, which is running. Both phrenic nerves run and this is the right phrenic nerve and here is the left phrenic nerve and these nerves run between the mediastinal pleura and pericardium this is the sternopericardial ligament you have superior and inferior sternopericardial ligament okay this is the sternopericardial ligament which i am stripping off and you can see the fibrous pericardium. The anterior mediastinum contains the two sternopericardial ligaments. You have superior and inferior sternopericardial ligaments which have been removed. And also you will see the lower part of the remains of the thymus, which is chiefly present in the superior mediastinum and extends into the anterior mediastinum. The uh, thymus is functional in the early part of life after puberty, it starts involuting and it is replaced by fibro fatty tissue. Here you can see the fibro fatty tissue of the thymus, which is the remains of the thymus. It's no longer functional in the adult. Now, the, on, the, here what you see is the pericardium, the fibrous pericardium. The, on either side of the pericardium, you can make out the two nerves, okay, a right and left phrenic nerve. These are the phrenic nerves, which are accompanied by the pericardiocophrenic vessels. The pericardiocophrenic artery is a branch of the internal thoracic or internal mammary artery, which serves as a guide for identification of the phrenic nerve. The phrenic nerve arises from the ventral ramus of C3, 4, and 5, and it is a chief motor nerve to the diaphragm, but also it has sensory component. The sensory fibers are derived from the pericardium, the mediastinal pleura, and the peritoneum. And the, uh, this nerve runs actually between the pericardium 
and the media signal pleura. On the right side, I have removed the media signal pleura, and it is in front of the root of the lung. And this side, this is, I have just left a little bit of the media signal pleura. You can see the media, I have stripped off the media signal pleura from the pericardium. This pericardium which you see is the fibrous pericardium and the fibrous pericardium is conical in shape. The base is attached to the central tendon of the diaphragm and here is the apex. The apex blends with the outer coat of the large blood vessels. Now we will reflect the deeper to this fibrous pericardium. You have a serous pericardium. The serous pericardium is a serous sac into which the heart has invaginated from behind, converting the serous sac into two layers, a layer which is applied to the wall of the heart, which is a visceral layer, and the other layer is the parietal layer, which is applied to the inner aspect of the fibrous layer. This is the parietal layer. And this thin serous membrane, they become continuous. This is the visceral layer, and here is the parietal layer. And the two layers become continuous with each other around the blood vessels that pierce the pericardium, right? So between the visceral and the parietal layer, you have a, a potential space, a pericardial cavity is there, which contains the pericardial fluid, a thin serous fluid that lubricates the heart so that the heart Mm, contracts without any friction. Now, let's see the, this is, I've just made a cut here on either side, just in front of the phrenic nerve, and reflected the fibrous pericardium, the anterior part of the fibrous pericardium, along with the parietal layer of the serous pericardium. What you see here is the heart, right? And the heart, of course, before we see the external features of the heart in situ, I would like to show you two pericardial recesses. One is a transverse sinus. The transverse sinus is a transverse channel lying behind these two big vessels. One is a pulmonary trunk. This one is a pulmonary trunk. Here is the ascending aorta. They are within the pericardial cavity. And I'm putting my finger in, this is the superior vena cava. You can see the superior vena cava over here. And I'm going to put my finger in front of the superior vena cava and behind the, pulm, behind the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk. And, and you can see the, my finger is coming out the other side. So this is the transverse sinus of the pericardium. The transverse sinus so lies behind the ascending aorta and pulmonary trunk, connecting the right side with the left side of the pericardial cavity. The other sinus, which is seen, actually developmentally, it is derived as a disintegration of the dorsal mesocardium and when the heart folds on itself, the arterial and venous end come closer to one another and get caught between the arterial and venous end. Here is the arterial end of the heart, the truncus arteriosus, which is divided into two by the spiral aorticopulmonary septum. So the back is the venous end of the heart. And the other sinus which you see here is a blind pouch lying, and my finger, you know, three finger is in the blind pouch. It lies behind, behind the left atrium. And so it is actually bounded on the left side is the left pulmonary veins. On the right side, right pulmonary vein infi and inferior vena cava. Superiorly, you can see pericardium get reflected onto the posterior aspects, okay? And if we remove the pericardium over here, we will see the other structures which are found in the posterior mediastinum, mainly the esophagus is there. So this sinus give room for the atrium, left atrium to expand, right? And so I have put one hand here, one hand here, the other hand is in the transverse sinus, 
and I can feel the this finger by my left three fingers, where I can see a partition which corresponds to the reflection of the pericardium, and it contains the upper margin of the left atrium that separates the transverse sinus from the oblique sinus. So these are the two pericardial sinuses, right? Now, let's go to the surface, the various surfaces in situ, okay, right? We are going to remove the heart also. After that also, we are going to study the surfaces, and that will be dealt by one of my colleagues. All right, this surface is known as, of course, the heart is conical in shape. Here is the apex, and the base is directed upwards and uh, backwards, and apex is formed by the left uh, ventricle, and it lies in the fifth intercostal space. Fifth intercostal, this is the thoracic cage, you can't give part of the thoracic cage, which has been reflected. And the apex uh, is on the fifth intercostal space, slightly medial to the midclavicular line, or it is about nine centimeter from the median plane, okay, right? In the fifth intercostal space is the apex of the heart, which is formed by the left ventricle. And the base, anatomical base, is formed by the, mainly by the left atrium and partially by the right atrium, right? And now let's see the surface, but we can see this surface very clearly. The other surfaces we can see once the heart has been removed. And this surface is the anterior surface, or it is called the sternocostal surface because it is related to the body of the sternum and the costal cartilages attached to it. So this surface is formed by the chambers the mainly. You have the, this is the right atrium, the right ventricle, this is the right ventricle, and here is the left ventricle. These three chambers form the anterior surface or the sternocostal surface of the heart, right? And the, actually there is a groove separating the ventricles from the atria, and this groove, the anterior part of the groove, the groove is called atrioventricular groove. It goes around the heart, and it, so it is also called coronary sulcus, atrioventricular groove or the coronary sulcus. This is the groove separating the right ventricle from the right atrium. So this is the anterior part of the coronary sulcus, which is filled with adipose tissue and covered by the visceral pericardium. When I dig out the fat over here, I'll be able to see an artery, which is the right coronary artery found in the floor of the, this part of the coronary sulcus. The right ventricle is separated from the left ventricle, which is thicker, the wall is thicker, and you can feel it also. This is the wall is thinner, and there is an interventricular sulcus. Since it is present in the anterior surface, it is called the anterior interventricular sulcus, which is also filled with adipose tissue covered by the visceral pericardium. And there are blood vessels lying in this anterior interventricular sulcus, namely the anti-interventricular branch of the left coronary artery, which is accompanied by a vein known as the great cardiac vein, great cardiac vein. The, this only, I said, anti, small part of the coronary sulcus. The other part of the coronary sulcus is obscured or it is hidden because of these two vessels. Right? And now, let's uh, see the borders of the heart, okay? So the sternocostal surface is bounded by, uh, you have a right and left borders, and there's an inferior border. The right border is principally, it's entirely formed by the right atrium, and the inferior border is mainly formed by the right ventricle, and partially close to the apex is by the left ventricle, and the left border is formed by the left ventricle, and superiorly you may find the uh, left auricle, okay, which is an appendage seen here, right? So that's about the anterior surface. 
the other surface which we see here, this one, okay, this surface is the diaphragmatic surface or inferior surface which is resting on the central tendon of the diaphragm, which can be clearly seen once the heart is removed. So uh, my colleague I will show you the other surfaces and other features of the heart, the external features, once the heart is removed. Dear viewers, now let us learn the clinical anatomy of mediastinum and pericardium. So as we all know, mediastinum is divided into a superior mediastinum and an inferior mediastinum. The inferior mediastinum is again divided into anterior, middle and posterior mediastinum by the presence of heart and the great vessels. So there are so many conditions that can affect each of the components of the mediastinum. So as it is labeled here, in the superior mediastinum, the space may be narrowed by a developing cervical rib or a tumor that affects the apex of the lung, which is called as the Pancoast syndrome. In the anterior mediastinum, the usual tumors are a tumor developing from the thymus or thymoma, a goiter from a thyroid gland that extends behind the manubrium sterni. This is called as the retrosternal goiter, a lymphoma or an aneurysm that mainly arises from the internal thoracic artery. Tumors or space occupying lesions in the middle mediastinum includes lymphoma, bronchogenic tumors and again aneurysms. In the posterior mediastinum, it could be a tumor affecting any of the posterior mediastinal structures, especially esophageal tumors, aneurysms of the descending thoracic iota or lymphoma. So when in such a narrow space formed by each of the mediastinum, when such a space occupying lesion comes, what happens is a series of symptoms happen, especially because of compression of the structures present normally. So compression symptoms varies depending on whether the tumor is in the superior, anterior, middle or posterior mediastinum. But in general, we can tell that the compression symptoms of mediastinal syndrome includes compression of great vessels, especially veins, which can result in superior vena cava obstruction, which will result in dilated veins and bluish discoloration of the upper extremity and head and neck. Tracheal obstruction can result in dyspnea and frequent cough. Esophageal obstruction can result in dysphagia. Phrenic nerve compression can result in paralysis of that half of the hemidiaphragm. If the left recurrent laryngeal nerve is compressed, it can result in hoarseness of voice. F involvement of the intercostal nerves will result in intercostal neuralgia. Involvement of the sympathetic chain can result in Horner's syndrome and frequent compression or continuous compression of the vertebrae can result in vertebral erosion. So this is called as mediastinal syndrome. The cause has to be treated. Only then the symptoms can be relieved. Next coming to mediastinal shift. So as you can see here, the yellow arrows show a shift in the position of the trachea. So this black shadow is the trachea. So there is a shift in the position of the trachea from the midline towards the left side. This indicates a mediastinal shift. So here, mediastinal shift can happen when there is a pathology in one side of the thorax. So if the pathology is on one side, mediastinal shift can happen to the same side or to the opposite side. So some condition produces shift of mediastinum to the opposite side. So as can be seen here, this condition is called as pneumothorax. We can see the uh, hyperlucent chest. So here there is a large pneumothorax and because of this pneumothorax, the lung has collapsed and this is the small right lung. And because of this large pneumothorax, there is a push on the mediastinum. So the heart along with the mediastinal structures have been shifted to the other side. The same condition may also be seen when there is a large or a severe pleural effusion. So in these two conditions, usually there is a shift to the opposite side, that is shift to the normal side. In some cases, there is a shift of mediastinum to the same side. Say, for example, due to an obstruction of the bronchus, the collapse of lung on this side can result in pulling of mediastinum to the same side. So this is called as mediastinal shift. 
Next is called as mediastinitis. It can be acute or chronic inflammation or infection of the mediastinal structures. There are so many causes for mediastinitis. Most commonly the cause is a neck space infection that spreads to the mediastinum. So as we all know there are several layers of facial and facial spaces present in the cervical region between the deep cervical fascia layers. So as we can see here say we have the submandibular space from where the infection can spread into the parapharyngeal space from where it can spread into the carotid sheath or the retropharyngeal space or directly into the mediastinum because of the facial continuity to the mediastinum. So the usual affected parts of the mediastinum are superior mediastinum and posterior mediastinum which can result in inflammation and infection of the structures and can produce symptoms similar to that was seen in mediastinal syndrome. Now mediastinitis can also happen following esophageal rupture especially during forceful esophagoscopy. So when we do a forceful endoscopy we should remember about the normal constrictions of the esophagus. If we forcefully in, uh, introduce the endoscope it can rupture through the esophagus. Next is called as pericardial effusion. So this is the applied anatomy of the pericardium. We all know that it is a serous layer that secretes a very thin film of fluid around the heart that helps the heart to contract and relax in a shock absorbed situation. So here we can see that there is an enlargement of the pericardial cavity. The heart can be seen as a, uh, a more opaque image within the cavity. So this surrounding is the pericardial fluid. So this is what happens. There is an increase in the pericardial fluid in the pericardial cavity that will now compress the heart. So what happens is if the pericardial effusion is not controlled immediately then it can result in what is called as cardiac tamponade. So here the fluid content in the pericardial sac is much more and this large amount of fluid or blood in the pericardial sac can compress the heart chambers and can prevent contraction of the heart. So when the heart stops contracting this condition is called as cardiac tamponade. The typical identifying feature of pericardial effusion in a chest x-ray is obliteration or change in the angle of the cardiophrenic angle. So this can be used as an identifier of pericardial effusion. Thank you for your patient listening.